this Astral Weekly episode 134. Not a great start to the day. We were scheduled to have some oversized material delivered at 8.30 this morning. We've brought the wrong material. Luckily, we spotted it. Driver's gone to tip it off at another site because luckily, locally, there's another one which will take it. Then he's going back to load up the correct material and he's gonna come back and we're gonna start filling this soak away. Happy to say Asheville Plant Hire went live today and we have shared with the rest of the industry what we are doing, but a couple of people who aren't from this industry asked me what plant hire was. Are you going to the garden center and hiring out plants so people put them in their garden? That is not what we're doing. Plant hire basically means that we're gonna be buying machinery and equipment and we're gonna be renting them to other people within the construction industry. Me personally, I think it's the final piece in the jigsaw for Asheville to provide a full construction supply chain offering. The phones at the office are ringing already. Only one person so far has called and asked to rent some flowers for their garden. I've managed to get the message across in some ways. So the dogs, don't the dogs have the hooks on them or are they just... So I've got bangers, but the bangers I've got yeah. are for the three ton chains that I bought off you previously. And it's like an okay. eight to 10, it's got the eight to 10 mil thing on the end of it. They're eight, they're eight to 10, but you're yeah. going to size up. If this was just on a normal flatbed, we'd only put probably two chains on it, but we're going to put three on it just to make sure we hold it yeah. all in place. So we want four chains, six meters long, and we're going to have them, uh, the latch hook on both ends again and they're going to be the 10.6 lashing and we want four of the ratchet binders in 13 mil size to suit. Yeah, okay. So do you want me to just cost it all up, just give you a quick price or just, just get it done? I assume that you will be gentle. So the 10 mil chains has gone up a lot in price post pandemic. Ah, oh, no, no, come on now, let's not start all that. Gone up so, in price. I'll just get everything ordered on the way. It should be all here tomorrow. It certainly went. Would you go and collect from here or do you want us to drop it to you? Or? Drop it. Let me know when it's all ready and I'll let you know. Probably drop it to us, but okay. you never know. I might be in the area. Always nice to see an Ashball vehicle on the road. That's Dudek heading back to the refurbishment project. I pulled in and saw one of the drivers struggling. I've reset the wheel wash because it wasn't going off and so hopefully now it will start working properly. We need the road to be kept completely clean and those lorries tyres to be clean and not have any uh, rocks or stones or anything like that. Yeah. Credit to driver. How are you doing? Good, How are you I'm Daniel from Asheville and this is also Daniel from Asheville. We're trying to home in on all my crazy like Rain Man ideas so when we arrive we sort of have a format of exactly what we're going to do. After I film something on the barge, there's things that I could mention on the barge. I'd like the barge from all different angles. Just one thing, it's ships, not barges. See, well, I'm already learning. Mr. Park will be turning there, he'll be sitting. All right, so let's, uh, there we go. I'm going to change that word now. Yeah. They're ships. The time is 6.54. The weather has taken a terrible turn which is always bad for business. I spent some time sitting with David today talking about the refurbishment project in the main room. Because of the steels, we can't put the Velux windows exactly where we had planned on putting them. So we've got to move them ever so slightly. I spoke about this with Terry also, and uh, I think Terry's right and I'm convinced. Uh, I know we do film a lot of what we do, but Sometimes I think to myself that this is basically like the Truman Show. There's another camera watching the camera, watching everything that's going on here, and this is like some kind of made up world. And every time something happens, they say, what's the most difficult thing we could do to give him to sort out? What's the biggest problem that we could possibly give him? What can we do to just complicate matters? There seems to be something like just coming out of the woodwork, something you would have never thought of. Like we went through all the compliance, all our HMRC bits, the environmental inspection. And we get an email today to say that the council are coming to inspect the yard. Like it just, like the whole time, it's just, just always something. And then 
we've got all our lorries out and that Scania lorry that I spoke about last week that the engine went on the left and we went back to put the oil in it now the turbo's gone and it's gone back and the volumetrics all the augers and everything have been all repaired and everything's working perfectly and then on the one in the repair bay now the whole back of it needs to be rewired because the wires are rotten and there's no lights it's just and then there's another one the lorry's perfectly good but the easy sheet's fine but if, if the easy sheet itself is fine then the box on the easy sheet is gone and we had to order a new one and it came in and we had a problem with a sweeper and the one part we needed for the sweeper wasn't in stock and it just uh, it's an ongoing fight, but we're in the fight. We're definitely in the fight. I'm going to try and head to the gym. I don't think it's a wise idea because my shoulder is hurting and it needs rest. I'm just going to try and avoid, avoid incline press and try and stick to flat bench, which I don't particularly like. And I can see that Terry is in front of me. Hmm. You're lucky you answered. You are definitely now in trouble. <laughs> so am I lucky? <laughs> uh, stepping on my toes in the plant industry. You know how dangerous that is. What, what do you mean? What are you talking Your about? Oh, if you were that many left, you'd be begging for a right. Oh, you're referring to Asheville plant hire. Of course, you're going building garden sheds and things of what you've got. <laughs> you ain't going into the plant job. So I was going to sing Daniel, my brother, but I think our relationship is going to come to a bad end. Really? It won't do really because you'll have to get me to shift it because you've got nothing to shift it. So. <laughs> and you sound happy for me, like you're happy that I'm in the plant game. Of course, game. I'm happy for you. Hey, Jay's a good lad, isn't he? He started with us Monday. Uh, so you're you're suggesting that Will and Jay both work for you now? I'm afraid they do. I didn't want to tell you that, but I thought I'd better tell you before you find out. All right. Yeah. But he's uh, very happy. He's got the O'Donovan weekly now. Monday morning, I'm in the yard. Tuesday morning, I'm thinking about coming to the yard. Wednesday morning, I'm definitely not in the yard. I have a train of type one in the yard. Lovely new pink limestone, which I'm going to get offloaded, Michael. Funny enough, I've got one just backing in now. We're just getting ready to offload our train as well. Well, you offload your train and I'll offload mine. I'll speak to you in a bit. I'll bring you a See who's done it first. We are mid offload. The train which is coming in is going to be 50-50 with gravel and sand. The sand is for the company that sent the sand to us because they have a depot around the corner. We're going to get the shingle and put it in our bay and we're going to keep it for ourselves. But their sand, we're going to throw it onto lorries and haul it round to them. So once this train leaves, the other train turn up in about two or three hours, take the sand, stockpile it, start delivering it round to them and then we'll keep the shingle for ourselves. That's the plan anyway. But well, I wasn't very smart. I mean, I'm trapped in here. We're just trying to prepare uh, this bay. We need to change the sign at the top here. So we need to take that one off and the sign for the shingles over there. So we're going to swap them around, get ready for this train and get it offloaded. <laughs> Wednesday morning, I'm out of the yard. I'm at the refurbishment project, having a catch up with the lads. I'm very excited to see the progress of the work. We're just trying to work out a few items, but we keep finding things which keep rearing their ugly head, which we didn't know about. So the windows which were here, we removed them and then we removed the window sill. But now we've realized that the buildup of the wall underneath is absolutely rubbish and we need to take it all down and rebuild it which is very annoying but as this is design and build we have to take it as part of our work and it's at our cost because we couldn't have seen it before and it's not something which is major and we could leave it but we want to do the job properly and we want the new window sill and windows to have a very firm base we actually had the exact same problem on the other side of the property 
along the front of um, this bay window, but you can see this is one which we repaired already. So we're gonna replicate what we've done here over there. Here we are gonna have two boilers and two 300 liter mega flows or water cylinders, whatever you wanna call them. And they are gonna be situated in the house out of the way, but then the pipework from there is gonna travel all over the house. So you can see above us, this pipe here, this is a 36 mil pipe. This feeds the underfloor heating. So we have one underfloor heating manifold in this area. And if you, there's a T connection at the top from this 36 mil, and this goes to a 22 mil pipe, which is feeding the underfloor heating manifold, which is gonna sit here. Then from there, it continues on a 28 mil pipe, and that goes up to the first floor where the manifold for the first floor will sit. That 28 mil tees off to 22 mil to feed the underfloor heating manifold there, and then that goes up to the loft for the underfloor heat in there, again with a 22 mil, which will connect directly to the manifold. The rest of the pipes you can see in this area are hot and cold water supply pipes. Let's move on to the waste pipes. There's a toilet going in this area, and then we have the waste pipe running above me here. Over this side, we have the other bathrooms connected. Now you can see there, on the other side of the wall, that pipe is also connecting to this pipe, which goes through the floor and connects into the manhole. I was gonna put an access panel and open it, and then maybe have a chamber we could take off if we had to try and um, remove a blockage. But the boys pointed out to me that just outside the window, there is an, an inspection chamber there. So it's close enough that we don't need to do one here, and everything will be boxed in with insulation. The client will never actually hear any of these pipes flushing. You'll see that a lot of the aircon units are in already. So they're not connected. Once we begin the electrical work, we may have a little bit of a problem. By the time we've sized everything up, this house is a 100 amp free phase. By the time you count the swimming pool, which we haven't started yet, this house is coming in at about 110. But everything's being put into a model, which is gonna completely work it out. And I think we're gonna have to, have to upgrade to free phase 400 amp in order to be safe and never have anything tripping out. But it doesn't stop us doing the work because we'll have to contact UK Power Networks and get a quotation for the upgrade, which unfortunately we're gonna to have to pass over to the client. Once we have the electrical plans, we'll run the first fix of electrical and then we can begin to box all of these in and, and start to build the lovely uh, recessed ceilings with the LED feature that I've showed you in the past. You can see loads of insulation behind me. We're gonna to begin to put this down and do the underfloor heating and hopefully next week at some point, we're gonna run the screed on this entire ground floor except the kitchen area because there still may be a few changes. On the first floor, you can see the floor level of the loft in the master area. This is a conversation David and I had at my desk where we were talking about where the Velux windows would go because of the position of the steel. But now I look at it, it's actually worked out perfectly. Every time I come up to this loft, I feel like it's getting bigger. The structure is completely done. I have loads of head height in here and you can see the level to which the wall is going to be built up and then you can see the huge window that's going to be here and then standing in this area we're going to section this off so there's a bathroom in the corner over there and that has its own huge deluxe window very handy in a toilet to have a window like that this is where the stairs is going to come up you can see the steel structure around it we have a velux over there it is going to let natural light to the stair area we have a further three velux windows to let even more natural light into the space. Before I leave the loft, the client asked me for loads of storage up here. Well, you can't get better than this storage where you can put your larger items like suitcases in all the eaves. So we're gonna have a door here and up to the point you can see here, that's one storage area. And then we're gonna have another door there. It means that you can now crawl into the space down here, which is gonna be completely boarded. And over in this area, we're gonna do exactly the same. So all of the eaves in this area will have sort of hidden doors pushed to open. And all of those doors, you'll have storage and you can fill up all the eaves with all the bits you don't wanna see anywhere else in the house. All right, that's it, I'm heading out. I've gotta be in a meeting a very long way away. I am running late and the M25 is all blocked up. But of course, I know I always say it, but the work will continue. In the yard as part of the new offering of machines we're offering to rent out our l860 as well and a phone call came in and i thought yes result the only thing with um, transporting the l860 is you need a movement order so we gave them a price they said yes hurry up they got a boat in liverpool what they need to offload on friday not even sure that we would have managed to get the um, movement order in time probably not but we wouldn't have delivered it because of course we sold our arctics as i keep saying i massively regret that we have another problem and we did a video a long time ago when this was delivered to the yard you'll notice that the arm was fully down and it was tucked in and then we did another video not long after 
where we fitted the extended arm. So here's our boom and here's our dipper here. Because of the length of this new arm, we physically cannot tuck this underneath the machine. So if you have a look here where the rams are, when you try to bring this arm closer to the machine, you cannot manage to get this arm underneath so you can put the main boom down, which means we can't transport it, even if we take the bucket off, unless we disconnect these rams. And I ain't going doing that. We do have the expertise in-house, but we don't want to do that. And dismantling all of this and safely transporting it might take us half a day. By the time we get there, half a day to set it up. They offload the boat in Liverpool, half a day to take it apart, put it back on the lorry, bring it here. By the time you add all of that, there's nothing left in it and it takes everyone's time. So I thought we had a hire, but we don't. At least the name Asheville Plant Hire is getting out there and people are seeing us as an option. Uh, one of the Volvo concrete lorries. The driver noticed on his defect check in the morning that the rear lights weren't working on the body. They were working on the chassis, but not on the body. But while rewiring the back of the lorry, we spotted a crack in the frame of the volumetric. So now we've had to gouge it out and the welding to repair begins. <laughs> Last week, I ordered chains uh, to start help moving machines. So these are 13 mil thick and the lifting capacity is five odd ton for lifting, but for tying things down, capacity up to 10 ton. And over there are the 10 ton bangers. Went with some five ton ratchet straps to accompany these. So, but these are too heavy and they're too big to put in any toolbox on the lorry. So what we're gonna do is keep these separately. And the set you saw me with last week, those ones are significantly thinner. Three ton ones, I believe they are. They're eight to 10 mil. Those ones are gonna be stored in a container as well. So based on the delivery or the collection, the driver's gonna take the ones which they need, but they'll keep the ratchet straps on the entire time. And then my favorite, if I can do everything at once, which I try to do on a daily basis, are these. So these are, six meter long uh five ton straps these are great when you're moving anything around in the yard we're going to keep these over there in this area because by god somehow they keep going missing and nobody knows what happened to them dan simon the accountant the sergeant major himself is coming over and he's going to help me sort out this gear what are you saying wilson how's it going do you want to see you want to see what i'm doing right now you'd love it i think tell me i'm in dry dock no way. It's an expedition ship and it goes to Alaska and it goes to ice and it goes through ice. Quite crazy. Hey Wilson, I don't really like how your dad stole you for the family business and now you're getting DJI and, and you're filming there and not filming. I don't really like how your dad's done that, you know. I paid for this <laughs> to film a video for him. Yeah, your dad's a rude boy still. Your dad made you take your own money, what he paid you to do a job and now you have to take it to film his stuff. Yeah, we like that. Wilson. Exactly. I flew my drones off the first time since I... Since I left, I didn't crash, which is a first. Cut away when Wilson crashed. Cut away, <laughs> cut off my knees and crashed into the side of a water tower. Yeah. Congratulations on your new business. Thank you, Wilson. What are you saying? Your dad will rent 100 machines off us. To be honest, I think a 75 tonner would be good to dig out our back garden. We've also got... <laughs> What are you saying? You need the uh, LA60? No, something a bit bigger than that. Oh, <laughs> oh man. We put a smoke on my, machi on my machine, now you left, yeah? Wilson's just checking in. He's uh, working with his family's business now. That's one you're getting. And he is uh, filming in the same way what he would do here. Say hello to everyone at Asheville. It's so windy. Oh, look. Why are you giving other brands promo in my video? 700 Thursday morning and I'm most definitely not in the yard. I'm at Liverpool Street Station. I am heading out on trains with John Smith, the MD of GB Rail Freight, heading to Ipswich. We're going to be in Felixstowe. I'm going to be traveling all around the country and I am going to be in the cab of freight trains. John's here. He started a conversation with when I was on the tools. There's hope for me yet. I started 70s as a, what they call a technician apprentice, then worked in the machine shop, a massive carriage works, building trains. And so then I moved out and started working on maintaining trains. It allowed you to migrate from pillar to post, so you'd, you'd go, I fancy working in London. And I worked on at Bounds Green on HSTs. 
Uh, then crew on the overhead line. Maintenance, yeah. then building, yep. then on the overline. Yep. So basically now, when somebody tells you there's a problem, you understand exactly what it is. Oh, yes. I still think that uh, if you know how the thing ticks, yeah. and particularly in the railways, because it's, uh, it's uh, almost a lifestyle. But how do we go from overhead lines to... My main test when I was in London was doing fault finding. But I wasn't very good at it. So, but I used to get on with people. Um, so slowly migrated into managing. I ended up in London running the main depot at Wilsdon. Maintenance staff at Norwich, it was the drivers that drive these things up and down. And then I had the opportunity to set up GB Road Freight, so we started that from scratch back in 1990. What we try and do within GBRF, treat people as individuals. When people talk about productivity and how you get people to work harder. If you look after people, they will commit to you and work hard. And, that, and that's kind of the ethos that we started with when there was, well, it was just me to start with, but then there was 20 of us when we first ran a train and we've got about 1,500 now. 1,500 people at GB Rail Freight. How many locos have you got? You know, it's oh, about 150. I couldn't uh, be precise. From working on the tools and fitting to the MD of a huge rail company. So, see, it is possible. <laughs> All is possible. Everything's possible in life if you apply yourself. You have to have a bit of passion. Yeah. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. You do. Yeah, no, I do. I do. Yeah, a lot of the time I do enjoy ah, it. There are some, there are some hey, dark days. There are dark days. We've had a few. I've had yeah. the sleepless nights. I wake up at three o'clock screaming. But, yeah. but, you know, you get up in the morning, dust yourself off and work it out. And you go again. Yeah, and you go again. We are back in the port of Felixstowe. We managed to get an Uber, which was very, <laughs> which we were very lucky to get. And if you remember, the last time we were here is when we were collecting all the Asheville merch. Click here to watch that video. No, I haven't. <laughs> no, I've got a selfie stick. This is a selfie stick. This is all right. This is what I use. What we can see here, there's still 10 and a half meters of this ship still in the water. This ship can hold 24,000 standard size containers. You can stack 11 containers, what we can see high here, but below deck, you can also have 11. So all in all, that's 22. So that's the crane operator up there with the glass floor, and he has to load and offload everything. So he's back and forth the entire time. This ship is very similar to the one that was in the incident on the Suez Canal. And I just found out that if there was an emergency and this ship needed to stop, it would take four miles. <laughs> four miles for an emergency stop. At the Port of Felix though, they are constantly making improvements. What you can see here is the second oldest crane. The oldest one was from 1981 and it has been pulled down. So they take the legs from under it, they put loads of sand and earth on the ground, they attach trucks to it, pull it over and then break it away for scrap. This is currently the world's biggest ship on its maiden voyage. It's 60 meters wide and 14 meters of it is below the level here, which you can't see. But this pier at its shallowest point is 16 meters. And this is 14 meters underneath. You only need to have 30 centimeters of clearance between one of these and the bottom there. So this is a traverser, so the loco will park on this and this will shift and move it onto another line so it can do like a run around and collect at the front. We're going in, we're going in. Oh, 
John Rees, QPR fan. Always, always proud. Always. The R's, the R's. Up the R's. How many containers we pull in? 30, 40 foot and 120 foot on today. Uh, 1183 ton. So we're ready to go. Time to get moving. You've done many cab rides before? I did do the simulator. Emergency. Why does it feel like we're going uphill here? Because we are. Uh, we are. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, it is, yeah? Yeah, yeah. This is the main railway that serves the port. Uh, rail takes 32, 33% of all the boxes out. You'll see another one of our trains up there. We'll cross over in front of him. So you're saying that, that train ahead and that cross in here, we're going to flip onto the other line, yeah? Flip onto the other line. Are we going to switch? John, so I see there's a couple of empty wagons on this train. There's a couple of things. We import more than we export, so we buy about three times as much as we sell going out of the country. I mean, it's all driven by, you know, warehouses stocked up post-COVID, people slightly worried about recession, um, whether they spend their money or whether they keep it in the bank. And, you know, these containers have everything in them from a B&Q socket set through to might even have a car in one or, or rice or food. Everything gets carried in these boxes. Well, I keep hearing this, this word when I'm here, intermodal. Like, what, what, what does that mean? Intermodal is the carriage of various goods um, in containers on ships, on road and on rail. The containers can be loaded with anything from computers through to foodstuffs. They first developed back in the 1960s and have become the standard mechanism by which goods are transported throughout the country, including onboard mega ships. How important is this intermodal for like our economy? Uh, it's vital. Well, During COVID, it's far more appreciated how important the, the, the boxes were. We, we, we did a spin on the fact that we were bringing the wine to the table before Christmas, um, <laughs> which, you know, is a nice spin, but actually yeah. it's true. John, how similar is this train engine to a lorry engine? You will get out of that engine, I, I'll go in all the units, you're 3,300 horsepower. So what do you get out of a lorry? That's a engine, so like a 410. Clever thing on the train, it's not so much how much power you've got, it's how it puts it down to the rail. Because you've got to remember each wheel sits on a space no bigger than a sixpence. Right, I've been given a job and I want to be useful. So I uh, need to uh, let everybody know that we're in the area. <laughs> Another one? Go on. <laughs> and that's me doing a day's work. <laughs> we're now in Peterborough. Uh, John is being relieved and we've jumped out and we're going to jump back on a passenger train and head into central London. Uh, the time now is 12 minutes past one. I couldn't answer my phone at all when you're in the cab because you're not allowed to be on your phone. So I've got a number of calls I have to return and loads of emails I'm going to try and respond to as well. But you know that I am into trains. So this was a lot of fun. The time is 6.37. I'm actually at home. I haven't managed to do a lot today with emails. I managed to check a little bit earlier, but I haven't done a lot of work. I've got about 70 emails to go through and I want to get them all done today. I was meant to go to the gym, but it's either that or this. And to be honest, my upper body is an actual mess at the moment. I've been training so much, it hasn't had a chance to recover. So all I'm training at the moment is legs, cardio and core just to keep everything in order. And I'm not eating very well. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Spending a day with a man who's gone from the tools to running a 500 million pound company in GB Rail Freight is inspiring. We spoke about some videos that we're gonna do and we're gonna be able to bring to you which are gonna be epic. Well, I think they're gonna be epic because I'm into trains. And I know every now and then you guys like to humor me and watch me on my train antics. So I'm gonna crack on with this work. I don't know how long it's gonna take, but I'm gonna do it till it's done. That's it for first day. First day morning. I'm on the road again. And the concrete lorries are about to start a 100 meter pour. And it's first thing in the morning and the boys are outside, ready. Let's get this concrete poured. I just went
trying to look at a job, trying to explain to the client there that in order to do the job, there are two parts of it. There's like building a new garage by breaking down the existing one and there's a outhouse going in the back. If we were gonna do the work, uh, the sequencing, we would smash the garage down and use the access on the side to get through with all the machines and the dumper. We collect the muck and bring the materials to the drive. Dumper would take it back and forth. We pour both slabs at the same time. We bring everything in at the same time. And they were saying, well, we might stagger the works. In staggering the works, trying to save money at this present moment in time, you're gonna, it's gonna cost you more money long-term because then we gotta bring everything back. But if everything's then and the people are there, then we can sequence the works accordingly and we can do everything at the same time. I have some good news in that last week I told you about the £20,000 that we got scammed for. We got seven and a half back last week. Barclays sent us back half the money again and it came on the bank uh, account as scam fund. So it appears it's being investigated and Barclays said they're working to get us the rest of the money. It's never nice to lose money, but to lose money in that way is terrible. Now I'm popping into the trade counter here because on the concrete lorry, the gate valve on the side, it's leaking. It's dripping, 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 and it's annoying for clients when the lorry's dripping water. Even worse when it's oil, but this is just water. So I'm gonna go in and grab one now. Here's what I was after. I got corrected, it's a ball valve. Terry and I spoke earlier and we have a target for the five concrete lorries before we get a six one. I haven't actually found another one yet, but we want to be doing about roughly on a day, we want to be doing about 160 meters. We got all the infrastructure in place to do it, but we're just doing a few bits on the lorries like this to make sure the lorries are 100%. We had like one lorry that everyone was always in and out of. A lorry's never treated when it's treated well when, when there's a different driver in it every day. We're now going to change this ball valve. We're going to put a driver in it full time, but the driver is actually on a tipper and he's learned to drive a volumetric. But we need about four tipper drivers. If you're a tipper driver and you live relatively close to the yard get in touch speak to terry with all respect in the nicest possible way with all respect when i say tipper driver i don't mean that one day you drove a car and if i teach you to drive the tipper that you will be the world's tip best tipper driver in six years and in the meantime you will smash the lorry to pieces not put oil in it damage the engine never clean it never look after it and do half a job a day not even one and then blame everyone else i i, I genuinely mean if you are a tipper driver and you have worked in the construction industry in a tipper you're comfortable in it and you know your way around the lorry not because I'm not here to let people learn, it's just that at the moment, we can't do that. Time to get back to the yard. All right, so we've got one of them on. Look at the old one, look what's happened to this. Fully just split, look at that. Okay, next part. So this fitting is gonna go on here. Uh, when we tighten it up, this end will end up going in there. So this end will end up going in there. So this will be over that side. And then this will be on here. And at the end of it, we will have this coupling. And this is where we attach. So we can fill it full of water. Saturday morning. And I'm in the yard. We're preparing for Tuesday because it's bank holiday Monday, but we will be in here doing prep work. I'm not happy for the bank holiday because we're not out doing bits, but I am... Uh, thankful because it gives me a chance to catch up because I'll definitely be here and by Tuesday morning we'll be in a better place. Now Terry is away next week, he's gone on a fishing trip with his brother <laughs> and Terry is causing his family the same turmoil that he causes me. Terry's brother comes to collect him at 2.30 in the morning. Terry jumps in the van, the guy of France, they're going fishing. How they're going fishing without me, I don't know, because I'm the only one who can catch any fish out of the two of them, and I taught Terry to fish. Anyway, so they've driven to the port, and of course, Terry's forgotten his passport. <laughs> so Terry calls his dad, gets his dad out of his bed. His dad goes to his house, wakes up his wife and his daughter at 10 to five in the morning, and then his dad drives for two hours to go to Kent to give Terry his passport so Terry can go on the trip. Terry's brother's fuming, his dad's fuming, his wife's fuming. Welcome to my world. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the man does deserve a holiday. He works bloody hard. So Terry, you have a good fishing trip and do your best to catch one without me. 
Asheville plant hire has a few bits of kit out. If someone's gonna take two 20 tonners on a 30 ton machine off you because they have to do some demo and then they have to do some remediation works. They take the machines at the beginning of the project. So we price for a few projects and hopefully just before the lorries go out and start helping them with the muck and bringing in the crush for the piling mat and stuff, that will be when they'll take these machines off us just before then. But I'm just taking a look around the back for no particular reason other than the fact that I'm just excited that there are there's Asheville plant hire kit. It's very difficult trying to get hold of machines at the moment. So the fact that we've actually got them and uh, we're working closely with Fox Brothers and B&W plant hire, and it means that we have access to 5,000 bits of kit. It means that now we're a one-stop shop. We don't have dumpers sat in the yard, but I'll get the dumper to site the next morning. That just means that people can come to us with a tender. 1,000 cube of muck to come out, 500 cube of crush to come in, and then after the piling mat, then we've got to take all of that out. Then we need concrete for the pilers. It just means that in our submission with our concrete waste management and material supply, we can now say we have the machines also. So you don't need to call anyone else. Don't worry about that other fella with the machines because that other fella with the machines, he will start offering you the muck away or his pal who does muck away. So final piece of the jigsaw, but it's not moving at 100 mile an hour because you can't and there's so much compliance and governing bodies we need to be attached to and the system that's going in place. So at the moment, we're storing all the information manually. So on the cloud, which I keep going on about, uh, we've created all these documents and we've got all these procedures. Um, the one you saw me create with Terry a couple of weeks ago, how a machine gets a fleet number and the process we need to follow to make sure that we are being compliant and we have protected ourselves and we have protected the clients. Doing all of that manually, as soon as the system's in place, which is still about eight weeks away, once that system's in place, all the information will transfer onto it. But I still love coming over and looking at these machines. You know, it's expert him. Expert, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, tell him, yeah, him, yeah, is bad, you know, in just chocolate, yeah. Chocolate is just bad. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, we in. Chocolate and Coke. Explain Choc it, man. Your diet can't be just chocolate and Coke, yeah? Coca-Cola. Yeah. You can't just have chocolate and Coke all day. Now, Flo Flo's right, mate. He's right. He's right. We need to put this on a block and we have to put this in the middle, yeah? We need to clearly label it. Otherwise, things will happen and people will say, I didn't know. So I need you to come in here and pick up all the rubbish. I don't want any rubbish here, please, yeah? Pick it up. Give it a sweep. All of this. If you see any shovels and stuff, put them against the wall. The sign needs to go there, yeah? You know this, mate? Too much chocolate and coke, that's why you're not thinking straight. Because the lorries are turning here to go on the Weybridge, yeah? All right, we'll use the sweeper, we'll suck it out. Um, we'll get it low, scrape everything down, and we prepare to concrete. We've got to concrete this on Monday, so it's dry for Tuesday. Yeah. It's not raining this weekend either. Fine. Yeah? Oh, man, it's a lot of concrete, man. It's got to be done. Don't laugh. It's got to be done. All right, but make sure we scrape everything back, clean everything around here, all of it, yeah? Okay? Thank you. All right. Sunday morning. No, it's not. It's Sunday afternoon. It's 1 p.m. I'm not in the yard, and I haven't trained today, and I haven't done my flying lesson because I was working on some scripts. Asheville team are going to Glen Sander in Scotland very soon, and we're going to be filming some standalone videos. But in order to do that, I need to be prepared with about five scripts and I needed the clear time. Now I have to go to a meeting because I'm also preparing for two meetings tomorrow. I have people flying in from Canada to have discussions about the volumetric trucks and I have Matt flying in from Switzerland and we have a long meeting in the diary. But work continued today, yes, on Sunday, at Andrew's house at the 50 million pound garden salvage project. <laughs> Dug a trench and filled it with geotextile membrane, filled it with a 20 mil shingle, put in the perforated pipe, cover it with shingle, and then wrap it back over to protect it with the geotextile membrane. We're doing this today and tomorrow to make sure we can push forward as much as we can because at the end of next week, there are scheduled works which are gonna happen. And that's it for Asheville Weekly, episode 134. Click here for the Asheville website, click here to subscribe to our channel, click here to see an Asheville video you may not have seen before, and click here for last week's episode, which was number 100 and 33.